How's it going, sports fans? You are listening and watching the Phil Talk Sports Podcast, where we cover the latest and greatest in the world of sports. Joining me is Nick Rice, the play-by-play announcer of many sports. I was going to say NCAA announcer, but you kind of do a little bit of everything. Uh, Our last episode, we were talking about football, just getting back in the swing of things, and now we're just about overwhelmed. I mean, hockey just ended, baseball's in full swing, the NFL is back, and I think there's some basketball game going on that you want to talk about later. So uh, I don't know about you, but um, I'm just swimming in all these sports. How are you doing out there in Cali? Uh, Well, you know, I went through the uh, thrift shop and I found this thing. I figured I might want to wear it. Um, with that being said, um, pretty excited. You can call me announcer, but really you can call me a Laker fan. Um, I'm still around. We won 17 games a few years ago. Um, <laughs> and I find it hilarious how Laker, Laker guys are talking about how tough it was for 10 years when I feel like uh, <laughs> Lakers tough is nothing. I mean, it really is. It's like, it's like whenever the Patriots don't win the Super Bowl, it's like they really endured a lot that year, did they? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, big Laker guy. That was that was pretty cool, pretty awesome. Yeah, and it reminds me of the Yankees. Like you don't think of them as a team that hasn't won a title in twelve years because it's the Yankees. So you don't you don't think yeah. to feel bad for them. Um, but yeah, so no. we will get to uh, NBA final stuff here. But uh, first, we are three weeks through the NFL season, and it's been literally no hiccups at all. There's one that's going to be happening this week that we will bring up here in a minute, but. Just to cover some of the base storylines so far through the NFL season, um, I think the biggest one is safe to say it was Tom Brady in a uniform that didn't say Patriots on it, obviously with Tampa Bay Bucks, They're sitting at 2-1 and one atop the NFC South, whereas his old home in Foxborough, being led by Cam Newton, also 2-1, and one, currently not in the lead in their division because the Bills have been playing pretty decently. But uh, I think the main storyline is just the who's going to do better Brady or the Patriots situation and they both have the same record right now uh the Bucks are sitting atop the division um the first game for Tom Brady was the not so great one against uh New Orleans but after two very winnable games after that he seems to have found his confidence with the Buccaneers I'm sure you've watched plenty plenty of uh Tom Brady's games over these past three weeks how do you feel he's clicking with his with his new Buccaneer teammates Well, I appreciate you shouting out my tweet of uh, my Super Bowl way too early prediction. (laughs) And I'm not going to lie. We're we're a quarter of the way pretty much through the year. And and, and I'm about as as unaware as to what really is going on as when the season started. Mm -hmm. Because Brady was bad. You were nice saying he was okay. He was bad against the Saints, but he's been really good the last two weeks. So what does that mean considering who he played? Uh, Cam Newton looked great. Um, for the first three weeks of the season. But, of course, um, Jakob Johnson, it'd be nice if he blocked somebody on that goal line run. Um, it'd be nice if Julian Edelman caught that touchdown pass. So, you know, it's, it, it's been fascinating. But I would say right now, I think if we're going to be completely honest, we could have seen Brady like this. But I thought the Patriots were right. But I'm surprised just how good they're playing. And they got the Chiefs this weekend, so that'll be very fascinating. Yeah. And before the season, on paper, they didn't stand a chance. Eight opt-outs, Tom Brady gone. Um, their running game is nothing like what we could see the, the, the Chiefs put together. Uh, Edwards Hilaire looks awesome. But, yeah, the, the, the Patriots are just behind the radar, and they're really playing well right now. Better than I thought, better than I think a lot of people. Yeah, and they're definitely not a team that's used to being behind the radar. I still think when you look at the league as a whole, it's kind of Buffalo's division to lose. Obviously, when they finally play each other, we're going to learn a lot about both these teams because the Bills are sitting there at 3-0. Uh, if they can't take out the Patriots this year, it's just never going to happen. So, um, I'm going to see they play right now, by the way. I, I want to make sure we know what's that? for the fans out there. I, I want to know when they play. I, I want the fans to know for sure. So we could circle our calendars on when we yeah. go on here next yeah. on the podcast. And that's after – that's week eight. They play a okay. Sunday afternoon. So that will be – That's fun. a late – that's a late first game for them. I guess, they, you know, they'll, they'll play yeah. they'll play twice in like five weeks or whatever. So that, that'll be – that'll be good moving forward for them. But, yeah, I mean, the uh, Patriots with Cam Newton, totally different looking offense, obviously. It's kind of Cam and a bunch of guys. They're letting him do his thing, let him run around. He's doing a Superman pose. Belichick seems to have – something that resembles a personality, which is new. Um, And then the Buccaneers have kind of, even though they lost to the Saints, they've kind of tripped up in weeks prior. So um, I think it'll still come down to New Orleans and Tampa. I think Brady could maybe beat them in the second meeting. 
But uh, that I had the Bucks going nine and seven, ten and six anyway. I'm not quite ready to move off that. If I do, I'm only going to give them another game or so. But um, you know, Brady clearly has something left. He, he didn't come out there as a shell of a man, but uh, he's still working things. His receiver core has not been. 100% healthy. I know this because I have both receivers in different fantasy leagues and Godwin and Evans, to my knowledge, has not been on the field at, together at the same time in any of these three weeks. So eventually nope. that will, you would think it work themselves out because they're not serious injuries. They're out for a week here, a week there. I think eventually uh, that will come together and we will get, I think the late season meeting between Brady and uh, Breeze will, will be for the marbles of the NFC South. And that'll just be something great to watch, hopefully with some fans at that point, because uh, yeah. That's another another thing about this year. Every team is different. Every stadium and state has a different uh, situation with it. We've seen plenty of games with no fans. We've seen some with a few fans. I don't know how much it's affected my viewing enjoyment until you just look up and see the empty seats. But um, as you just watching it on television, does it hinder your enjoyment of any game without the fans there? Um, very, very slightly. I, I think that there isn't enough really to make that big of a difference. But to touch on your Buccaneers point, all of these guys in and out for the Bucks is something. But to me, what's a lot more is Bruce Arians and how vocal he is after every game. Week one, yeah. it's Tom Brady sucked. Week two is our, my receiver's got to catch passes. Week three, we've got to be more engaged. I just find it fascinating how a guy who hasn't done much he made the conference title in 2015 with the Cardinals, Bruce Arians. But other than that, he hasn't really accomplished much in the league. I find a guy that hasn't done much very vocal very early in the season. So I, I am a little concerned about why he feels this emboldened to do that. I do appreciate his urgency because it almost reminds me the opposite of that would be, for example, the way the Clippers handled the bubble. They feel like they have a couple years with this core – so they didn't – I forget who it was. It might have been Paul George saying this this year was not championship or bust. And, Paul George. Um, yeah, it was Paul George. And whereas some of the other guys on the team were like, well, can we pretend that it is? Because we like a ring, please. So, like <laughs> – and obviously they got upset by the Nuggets and that robbed everybody of that battle for L.A. in the Western Conference Finals that we all wanted to see and all assumed we would see. Um, yeah, so the – was like, oh, this is news to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. They're like, I don't think everyone feels that way, Paul. But – um. So to bring it back to Bruce Arians, granted, he has Brady for another year, right? Two-year contract. But there's no reason to think like that. You might as well act like – because, again, Brady in another year, that's a whole another year of, you know, we'd be, what, 43, 44 at that point. So there's no yeah. point – there's no there's no negative to acting like this is a championship or bust year. Like, you might as well play it like that. I mean, some teams know when they have a window open. They don't know how much it is open. But uh, I'm okay with Bruce kind of staying on everybody's toes. Brady in particular, I'm glad, like, I don't want to say treat him like every other guy because that's overplayed. But, like, he is the new guy on the block. He's there to make this work. And, like, I don't think he deserved a bunch of flack for, like, week one. I mean, this is a team that had no uh, preseason, no practice, you know, very little practices against a Saints team that's had the same core for a very, very long time. So, yeah. if anything, that was a – um it reminds me, like, when, when college football is, is making its return and, like, Nebraska has to play Ohio State the first game. Like, that's probably not a good, uh, a good representation <laughs> of how good or bad that team is. They're going to get the, the brakes beaten off of them because it's Ohio State. So, I mean, Brady looked bad in the first one. And then with the two very winnable games, I, I think it's, you know, no disrespect to the Panthers or the Broncos. And the Broncos are missing their quarterback, obviously. But those might have been the games he needed to get rolling and this, you know, uh, second quarter of the season that we'll get into probably we'll do these quarterly NFL season reports it'll be interesting to see you know between these three games I'm giving him what like a like a solid B like right in the middle for Tom Brady I think that's fair yeah. I don't think I'm being too hard on him and then Cam might get a B plus I mean there's you can tell he's just kind of moving with it. The, the system isn't quite there yet so in the meantime they're just letting Cam be Cam but it's paying dividends mm -hmm. so uh, I think the um who wins the divorce is yet to be decided between, you know, Belichick and Brady. Uh, but it will be interesting. If you had to, with this small sample size, um, who do you think ends up better? I think the Patriots, even with the Bills, have the more winnable division because, I mean, you do have the Saints, the Panthers, um, and with the Falcons, which are a whole other train back over there. 
But um, if you had to pick a team to yeah. be more successful at the end of the year, uh, who would you be going with after these three games? I'd be going with Cam, but I think it might look better over the long haul with Brady because of that division. You referenced two games against the Bills, mm -hmm. but the Bucks play the AFC West, and I'm a Chargers mm -hmm. guy, <laughs> but I can admit, and we will get to them as well, yes. Yes. that it's, it's not a very tough uh, schedule for Tom Brady versus the schedule for Cam Newton. We've already seen, you know, the Seahawks is playing the Chiefs this weekend. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's a gauntlet. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, he had the great game against the Raiders, but they just ran for a bunch of yards. But, yeah, I'd say yeah. Cam Newton is probably going to play better this year, but that doesn't mean that Brady's not going to look good, in my opinion. I know it's early, but I think the Bucs, they, they got a shot here in the NFC. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the takeaway is Cam might have the more impressive, like, stat line, but that doesn't mean Brady's team couldn't translate it to more wins, potentially, because mm -hmm. they're, the, the uh, weight is not necessarily on Brady's shoulders. It's everybody else making his job easier. Um, so, yeah, I mean, through three weeks, they're technically tied. Uh, the Bucks have the, the slight edge by saying, hey, we're leading the division. So, you know, round one goes to Tampa. We'll see if that continues, I guess. Um, Next question. Leonard Fournette, I, was, I was telling you on the show, Leonard Fournette is good. Yeah. I mean, he, he's, he's just one running back there, but he's great. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, have a, they, they have a stable of them there. They got Shady McCoy and they got the, you know, the Ronald Jones guy who's, you know, supposed to be the guy and these other dudes just helping him out. Uh, next, next question here. There's been a lot of teams uh, not quite where we thought they'd be. What's more surprising for you? The Bears are 3-0 and or the Texans are 0-3? What's more surprising for you? I'm not going to lie. Both are not very surprising to me okay. because uh, the, the Bears, um, I knew that they were a good football team. I think what's surprising is that they, they won their first two, that guy at quarterback. Uh, yes. That, yeah. that, that bust, that quarterback. The, mm -hmm. the fact that they did what they did and Trubisky brought him back has been, has been somewhat surprising. But if I had to choose, I would say the Texans. Um, 0 and 3 because this is it for them. I mean, they're going all in. Mm -hmm. I mean, you knew they weren't going to be quite as dynamic early on without DeAndre Hopkins, which is proving out to be what we thought maybe yeah. even more a disastrous trade. But uh, yeah, Houston's put all their chips on the table. You know, they were falling behind. Like if this is some sort of a poke around, you know, they're losing their money. And like, listen, well, we got a little bit left. We're going to throw all of our trade assets into this year. And uh, right now, they don't look that good. I mean, they played a tough schedule. But Houston yeah. has has not looked competitive. I mean, just that opener stays in my mind. When Kansas City scored, I think it was like four and five drives, four touchdowns. And then, you know, the score looked better at the end. But they really did not look that competitive for most of the game. Yeah, I kind of put um, – I'm with you with the Bears, by the way. I, you know, I do the NFL picks thing. And week one, I, I picked them to win, but I picked them – thinking that Nick Foles is going to be the starting quarterback. So, like like you said, for them to get that 2-0 and o jump with Trubisky, and now Foles is where he's where he is, going to have the had the big comeback against the Falcons. That, you know, that's, again, if you're a Falcons fan, it's just – I'm sure it's just rough right now. But uh, – <laughs> You thought the Cowboys game was bad. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, the, with the Texans, like, yeah, it's a rough start, but it's, it's Kansas City, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh. Like, can you think of a – a more rough, you know, three game start to your season. And then, you know, they, they have the uh, Vikings coming up, which they are a, another 0 3 team. Someone's getting their first win this week between those teams. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, I, if you told me the Eagles were going to be 0 2 and 1 to start the year, I would be, you know, th that first week was just a real punch in the mouth to lose to the Redskins the way it all went down to be up 17 0 at halftime. Uh, don't score mm -hmm. another point. Wins the sack eight times. It was just the perfect storm. And then the uh, tie against the Bengals just has to be brought up because it's the only time in NFL history that two teams not yeah, so in the conference let's, have let's, tied twice. Right, right. Let's let's talk about that for a minute. And, and I know I'm 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 going to hurt you just like you're going to hurt me in a minute here. Um, <laughs> Sixty-four yard field goal for the win. Thirteen seconds left in overtime. Were you screaming at your TV right there? You're screaming at Doug Peterson. I think I was screaming enough that he probably heard me. He might have looked up and was like, what, what is that? I mean, he, he's proven, you know, Jake Elliott's proven before he's hit a 63-yarder to beat the Giants. It's one more yard. Uh, give him the chance. I mean, what's the yeah. 
if not, you get a rookie quarterback with a bad O line gets to throw up one hail mary. Like I'll take that as much yeah. as any other play. And and which I got to say, Joe Burrow impressed the hell out of me in that game because again, O line's not great. He took a beating. There's some shots you can find the clips of him on Twitter. Just absolutely like head rocking hits. Uh, got up. Just I I know he didn't play for partic- he played well enough. He didn't do anything like he maybe did against Cleveland throwing 61 times, not throwing any interceptions. Um, You know, that was impressive. But what impressed me was his toughness about um, taking those shots and and staying in the game. He actually got knocked out of the game for a play or two uh, in the third quarter, I believe it was. So, you know, as my disappointment for – I don't know how you go from calling the Philly special in the Super Bowl and punting against a rookie quarterback in overtime with 10 seconds left when you have a attemptable field goal to be made. I mean, that – I don't, th- I don't think that's at all a shot at um, Jake Elliott at all. I think it's for whatever reason he wanted to play for the tie. I don't necessarily agree with it because, like I said, you you miss and you give the Bengals the ball. They have, like, one to two plays that are going to be Hail Mary style. Um, and it's a rookie quarterback with a bad O-line. So, yeah, not – I was definitely in favor of kicking the field goal there for that one for mm-hmm. sure. I, You know, I understand there's an added risk about giving up a, even not just a Hail Mary, but you have – like 10 seconds left if he yeah. misses. You can I totally, I totally understand the risk. I'm not yeah. saying it was like a zero risk situation. I'm totally acknowledging the risk. But, uh, yeah, I, I still would have went a very different route with that. I mean, it sends a message to Eagles teammates. Yeah. It's like, yeah. all right, so don't believe that we pop him for two plays if he misses. So, yeah, I just – to me, that that was a little alarming, to be honest. But um, I also just want to add, Joe Burrow kind of reminds me. I'm not saying he's going to be Peyton Manning, but it reminds me of this rookie year, Peyton Manning, where it's like, yeah, this team's terrible, but he's showing signs. Definitely. And you know, week two against Baker Mayfield, everybody praises Baker Mayfield for the win, but Joe Burrow, who is a first round pick later, two years mm-hmm. later, has the better game, in my opinion. Um, with the worst talent, and he was right there at the end against Cleveland. So he's been very, very impressive. Um, if he doesn't win Rookie of the Year, I'd be, I'd be shocked. And I know Clyde edwards Hilaire has been great. Yeah, um, I think that's the two-horse race for that, without a doubt. Um, but, yeah, I mean, quarterbacks tend to get that little extra oomph. I think as long as he plays the whole year, you know, keeps up on this pace, I think it's it's got to go to Joe Burrow as well. Um, so we, we, we dogged on my team for a minute, so now we got to go to yours. And uh-huh. to me, this – there's two different questions here. Let's start with the more difficult of the two. The situation with Tyrod Taylor. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know about you. I've always been, a, you know, a, a casual fan of Tyrod Taylor. I love how he plays the game. There's a reason he's still in the league. To hear yeah. the story, yeah. <laughs> to hear the story of a punctured lung due to a cortisone shot uh, from a from a team doctor. I had to I had to read that a couple times. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I yeah, the Chargers, man. I mean, the Eagles. They, they, um, they. Of course, they just have a cluster of injuries the normal way, the conventional yep. way. You get hurt on the field. <laughs> uh, my goodness, you know the Chargers medical staff. I always was wondering in the corner of my eye for like a decade, like what's going on. And then, yeah, just uh, takes my breath, away, man. Takes my breath. These, these guys are just crazy. I have heard from other shows, and I mean, there there might be people listening that that played football on different levels that are are familiar with cortisone shots. To get it in your rib, that is a risk that you take when you get it. It's usually a very small risk. You know, one Uh in a thousand people might deal with this issue, and it happened to be Tyrod Taylor. Um, I don't know about you, but a lot of people probably thought, you know, they're trotting out to play the Chiefs, and uh, Justin Herbert gets out there, and everybody thought at the time, oh, "Oh, let's throw the rookie out. They got no tape on the guy, and and it almost worked. It almost made them look like a genius, even though that wasn't the reason uh, they did it. And last episode you that you were on, you had mentioned like you're not you're not dismissing Herbert, but you you weren't on you know on for him 100 percent of the Chargers taking him after two games. What have you seen? What have you liked? What don't you like? Um, he's, he's slightly better than I thought, but he looks like a rookie. Uh, he committed a bad turnover against the chiefs. He commits another turnover last week for the chargers. Um, he, he makes some nice throws. He, he throws a really nice spiral. I mean, it's easy to get completely fallen in love with the spiral and with his running ability. It's mm-hmm. like a six, five Russell Wilson sometimes taken off from the pocket. He's strong. He's fast. 
He runs into Damian Wilson at the Chiefs, and Wilson gets hurt. Yeah. <laughs> and they went on a head-on collision. It was like, man, this is a running back back there. But, um, yeah, he looks like a rookie still. Tyron Taylor is, is still the better quarterback. Mm -hmm. But I am – I will admit – I am a bit surprised. Uh, considering what he did, and I just want for folks who didn't watch, um, from considering the the decent numbers he put up in college at the University of Oregon, um, and the fact that he was there for a long time, and I didn't really know about him, and Oregon didn't have much success with Justin Herbert at quarterback, and considering the Pac-12 will get to college football soon, isn't exactly a conference that's hard to win. Um and I've figured that quarterbacks in the Pac-12 usually got to win the conference in order to be um, a great quarterback. Yeah. And even for the in terms of Marcus Mariota, who was at Oregon before, you win the conference and you're still just an okay NFL quarterback. So all that considered, I just didn't see him as a great guy in the NFL. But you know what? He's been great so far. And I think it's the size and the athleticism that's translating right away to the next level. And that's huge. Yeah, not all college numbers, I think, are created equal. Like you said, the Pac-12, yep. like the numbers don't mean what they would in the SEC or the Big Ten or even like yeah, a conference like the American where everything is pretty standard. So if you put up a huge amount of numbers, you know it's because you were good, not just because of the offense. Um, yep. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely reservations. I stuck with the – for this particular year, he seemed like the safest bet. He might have had the – lowest ceiling but maybe had the highest floor if that makes sense so like at the time yeah. I think he I think he was the safest pick and I, I do yes definitely looked like a rookie reminds me a little of Josh Allen's rookie year that you know like this guy won't be a total bust it'll just be a question of of how high it goes but at least um the whole but the thing with Tyra Taylor so is he he's got to be out for the year right I mean a punctured lung like what is I'm you sure you think into it you would think. I, I mean, he's been week to week. In fact, he was there, there was talks for a while that he might come back this week. But at this rate, whatever the medical staff tells me, am I really going to trust it? I'm, I'm getting a second, third, and fourth opinion if I'm Mr. <laughs> Mr. Taylor over here. Oh, um, man. Yeah, that, I can't think of a more wild medical facility story, like, <laughs> from the NFL, and I don't know how long, you know? Like, I mean, that, the, that, the, the Eagles uh, frame had I think it was years big. past – in years past with the Eagles, there's been, you know, little snippets of former players not really loving how the uh, medical staff worked there, but nothing like this. I mean, and I, I don't know that you can blame the doctor because as the research I've done, th it's a risk that you run when you get a shot in the ribs like that. It's just a very, you know, what are the odds that that would happen to an NFL quarterback, I guess. But um, so you're saying it's not like the memes I've seen where Vin Diesel's just laying in a hospital bed and then, and then some dude just comes in <laughs> and starts attacking him. All right, so it's, so it's not quite like that. All right, not, all right. From what I understand, no, it's not It's not quite like that. Um, oh, okay, so stabbing him with a needle. Right. So, <laughs> so all right, all right. through these three weeks, any other major um, things either surprised you or just worth talking about here for any other team that we haven't covered that you can think of? One, the Ravens got uh, run off the field, in my opinion, on offense. And, yep. and it brings up a big issue. Um, we're not going to talk about Giannis for a while, but, you know, I've been hearing comparisons, and they seem somewhat accurate. Yep. Lamar Jackson and Giannis Antetokounmpo with a lead, and they're dangerous because they, they are they're a threat to run at any time. They're, they're freaks of, of nature athletically, considering that Giannis is so big yet still can run the floor like that. Lamar Jackson is so quick and fast. He can take a bit of the hitting, too. He's not quite Cam Newton, but he still is just so nimble. One of the great athletes in the league, and he falls behind by seven, ten points. And uh, there was a number against the Chiefs and playoff teams. He's 0-5. That, that's something. And um, I'd be concerned. Yeah, three of those five against the Chiefs themselves. And Lamar even had the quote saying, they're our kryptonite right now, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, you can't argue with that at all. Um, but, yeah, they, they don't seem to be – I mean, there was a lot of talk of, uh, you know, Mahomes and Lamar being, like, the one and two in the league. And I think it's proof that if they are, that gap is wider than people are willing to admit. So, yeah. uh, there is that. I think that, you know, the Chiefs are, are, are rolling. That game was not as close as the score would have suggested, like you said. I mean, that was, was kind of over at half. There was a fumble to come out of the half for the Chiefs, and 
kind of let them back in it a little bit, but that door was never was never really open. They might have got the door open, but the padlock was still on it. So they're just looking yep. in, but they couldn't actually get in. Um, but yeah, it's I agree. Like, difference right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but nice. uh, yeah, that that was not a uh, that was not a competitive football game uh, in the second half, even though the score definitely helps a little bit. But it'll be interesting. I mean, the Steelers because of that loss are actually leading that division. They seem to be playing all right with Big Ben back and, you know, assuming he stays healthy, that could be a run at that division. And that's what it's been for years. And we really thought the Ravens were going to uproot them. And I, I do think they can beat the Steelers playing the way they do. It's just a matter of if they can, because it's that's kind of been another kryptonite just of a franchise long thing. Even before Lamar, that was always the issue. Even with Flacco, he, he bested them a couple times. But for the most part, it was all Pittsburgh. So that'll be interesting to see with that. Um, last NFL note before we move over to the collegiate, uh, it's only three weeks and I fully understand that, but if things go the way they go, I know Pat Mahomes is amazing. Um, this is Russell Wilson's MVP race to lose. I think three weeks in, I don't know how you yeah. think about that. It's insane. I mean, you know, we were, we were talking potentially Lamar Mahomes is that Brady Manning matchup, but to me, it looks like it's Mahomes and Wilson. I mean, that guy is just insane. I didn't think they'd make the Super Bowl because he just doesn't have enough supporting cast, in my opinion. And to this day, when you consider arguably the most impressive athlete in the NFL is Tyreek Hill, Travis Kelsey, I feel like I'm on a short list because everybody loves George Kittle. Travis Kelsey's the best tight end, in my opinion, in the NFL right now. Um, and you've got just a just a stable of running backs out there. Damian Williams, Clyde Edwards, Hilaire, whoever else you want to throw out there, Spencer Ware, whatnot. Um, not the same case, in my opinion, with Russell Wilson. I think DK Metcalf, is, as good as he's played, yeah. a lot of that is Russell Wilson, in my opinion. I think Tyree Kill, Travis Kelsey – and a couple other guys in the Chiefs would play great anywhere. But with majority of the Seahawks players, maybe Tyler Lockett's the exception, that entire starting offense of the Seahawks, I think they're good because of Russell Wilson. I mean, you see times where he just pulls out the most acrobatic plays. Um, and I'm looking forward. They don't have, they don't play on the schedule yeah. until the Super Bowl, if they yeah. happen to be there. And I think, right. I think that's a real possibility because Russell Wilson is carrying this team that, in my opinion, would be eight and eight if he wasn't the quarterback and if it was, you know, somebody else with a with a lung that is, uh, you know, all put together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, play a lot there. So. I, I think the best way to put it, yeah, you know, Mahomes is fantastic, and then Wilson is right there with him, and then Wilson is obviously doing more with less. I think is the the best way to sum that up because, like you said, you you look at a bunch of the Chiefs can beat you six different ways and the Seahawks can beat you one way and it's involving the guy wearing the number three under center like if he if he's yeah. off for the day it, it, you know a whole different team if if Mahomes has an off day you have the run game you can run end arounds Tyreek Hill you got that defense you have a couple different ways you can still beat a team. I'll admit Jamal Adams is really good though yes. that was a great pickup definitely but uh if 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 Russell Wilson has a bad day that team is not beating I'd say 70% of the teams they beat otherwise. So, um, I mean, Mahomes won the MVP, you know, last year. I don't think Russell has before. It would really be a, a big notch in his uh, legacy. So, like, if he wins, that's not a knock at uh, Mahomes at all. I think it's just truly it could be a fantastic – if they go 11-5, and five, make the playoffs, um, you know, I'd say make the Super Bowl, but the, the MVP is a regular season situation. So, as long as – um, I think as long as the Seahawks continue this and they win 11, maybe 12 games, like I think the MVP has got to go to him. For sure. I just, I just still think that with the Seahawks Super Bowl chances, he has 14 touchdowns, I believe, 14 mm -hmm. or 15 through the first three games, which is ridiculous. The guy that's second on that list through three games, I think had a very similar team and story, and that's Peyton Manning. 2013 Broncos, mm -hmm. where the Seahawks have a really nice defense. The Broncos, I thought, had a nice defense with Bob Miller. I think he got hurt midway through that year, so that did hurt him. Mm -hmm. But in the Super Bowl, when they got blown out by the Seahawks, they got exposed. They yeah. weren't quite as dynamic, and they didn't have – really, Manning was creating a lot of that offense, and, and unfortunately, that, that offense just fell apart. Uh, so it will be interesting. To, like again, I think Russell wins this round, and I think as long as they keep it going, 
uh, the MVP might it, might it might not be a tight race, much like last year when Mahomes kind of ran away with it. And then Lamar Jackson, off the name alone, I think he's a distant third if he's able to, you know, keep it together. Yeah. Uh, but that remains to be seen. So moving to uh, college football that is kind of started, depending on what school you follow. I mean, I, I've been lucky enough to see my Knights twice so far, which is more than some teams, but not as much as others. Uh, the SEC joined the fun this past week. There was some decent games going on. Big one being Mississippi State upsetting LSU in Death Valley. Um, is Death Valley really Death Valley without the fans? Who knows? But still big game for Mike Leach and his crew. Uh, yeah. Last episode, we had talked about is the Big Ten um, regretting their decision to uh, defer to the spring or the winter, as I like to call it. I think we have the answer, and that was yes, because they do plan to join – uh, join the fun back here late in October, I believe is the date, 24th, 28th, 24th. Yep. Um, so with Big Ten football being back, that gives us Ohio State, that gives me Penn State, that gives me a lot of other teams I want to see. Before we dog on them too much, I do want to say that I applaud their ability to say we might have jumped the gun on this, let's work our way back, and let's. they could have easily been stubborn and said, nope, we made this decision, we're going to wait till February or March or whatever yep. they decided. So I will start by saying I applaud them for admitting that they jumped the gun and doing necessary to, um, you know, with the, I think it's a 10 game season, but it's you know, in conference, they will finish up their season in time to be involved in the bowl system and the playoff if, if such a team emerges. So step one is I applaud them for getting this done and being man enough to just say, Hey, we jumped the gun. Uh, we're going to do what's necessary to get back on time. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that um, – and, and this speaks to all of you guys watching uh, the podcast right now. Just like how the Big Ten made a week or two, these podcasts are on demand. You can watch them at any time, and you can learn from yours truly and Phil and Ziada whenever you want to. Uh, there's no deadline to watch it. Um, I do applaud them as well. I do con- I do wonder if Ohio State runs the table, yet they still are questioned to get in because of a pretty significant rest disadvantage. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, there's like three or four weeks extra rest for a team like hypothetically Alabama versus, you know, a team like Ohio State or Penn State. And I do wonder if um, when it comes to the rankings, if they wait – for the Big Ten to finish all that. Because you usually get the rankings right after the conference championships. Mm-hmm. But as far as I'm concerned, they're going to have to wait a few more weeks while teams are just sitting by. How do they grade that? I don't think anybody knows right now. No, I mean, I think there's even – I heard a story today that they are pushing back the first official rankings. You know, not the not the um, Associated Press and the ones that we have now, but the, the college football rank, you know, playoff rankings is <laughs> yeah, going to come yeah. – I think two weeks after the Big Ten. That way, every team has some form of sample size. Um, right. So, I mean, I think it does all come out in the wash still because, like, as I look at, like, the night schedule, they play this week. They were supposed to play FIU the week after. Now it's just a random bye week. So everyone will start to take shape, even these teams that, that played early on. They might take two random weeks off because of games that got canceled. So I think by week yeah. eight or nine, everybody's going to – have played remotely the same amount of games. Uh, there are some schools that are only playing 10, and then there's some that are playing nine. So I think a one-game difference isn't that bad. But I think mm-hmm. as far as playoffs goes, um, if it's not Ohio State and maybe Penn State, I would like to think Penn State would get that nod if they ran the table and won the Big Ten and all that. But if it's not one of those, I don't think they're – I think they've proven in the past that even when Wisconsin has a great team, uh, they don't feel inclined to put them in over, say, a Georgia with one loss or something. So unless you're talking about an Ohio State that ran the table, it's not so much a playoff discussion. Whether that's right or wrong, I think if you win uh, the Big Ten, chances are you had a great year and you're a great team and you should be in that discussion. But uh, they definitely see it differently sometimes. So you're, you're, you're saying that, you know, the, the schools that they know – whether they play 12, 10, or 9 games, it's not really going to make a difference in their decision-making. I, I think branding matters to them. I don't think it should, but it does. I do think a not all conference champions, even in the Power Five, which is a made-up concept, by the way. It's not something recognized by the NCAA. It's just something that we bring up all the time. Um, I think a 10-0 and 0 Ohio State team will be looked at better than a 10-0 and 0 Wisconsin team, and certainly more than a – 
ten and zero Purdue team if such team ever emerged. You know, just because right, right, um, right. I, I do think those. I, I would like to think they would keep Penn State in that conversation, but even then, I think Ohio State gets that little a little jump uh, prior to that too. Um, but the the four teams, I, I don't think in a ten game season like this, they might feel inclined to put the second SEC team in here, which isn't always. I mean. Last year with LSU dominating everybody and, and Georgia getting in, uh, they, um, you know, didn't look great. So the gap was wider. I think the SEC is a little tighter. Obviously, LSU already having a loss. Uh, we don't quite know who the best team in the SEC is. It's only been one week, obviously. Um, so that might help. But in this situation, we might end up with a two-loss SEC champion if LSU writes the ship or something like that. Yeah. So with these less games, it definitely makes it a little more exciting. You don't get the – People don't get to pad their stats with um, Louisiana Monroe on their schedule. No offense to the guys down there, but you know what I mean. Like, right, there's no right. stat, there's no schedule padding. Your your schedule is what it is because of the teams you're playing. And if you can, you know, run the table. I mean, UCF opened the year against Georgia Tech. That was their circle on the calendar game against the ACC opponent. Took care of business. Everything else is American teams. And for every Cincinnati and Memphis that are considered good teams by most. You got East Carolina and Tulane. So you got to take the good with the bad with all these schedules now because you're only basing it off of the teams in your conference. I'm sure Central Florida is telling Alabama right now, join the party of schedule equality, all right? No more Citadel before LSU. Um, they just got, you know, Alabama, you just play every SEC team before a bye, and then you got the Iron Bowl. So um, that's something I, I'm not used to. Usually when I look at the schedule, there's a couple of, uh, teams with logos that are unavailable because they're oh, SCS. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, Alabama looked good. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tight fan. Week one, Mac Jones looked great. Najee Harris, California kid, looks pretty solid. But yeah, we don't know right now. Um, I would say LSU looks pretty, looks uh, like they should down 14 starters from last year. Even yes. if they run the table, I think it's pretty safe to say they're not going to be as good of a team as they were last year, considering all the talent. And, and unless these guys develop a lot over the course of the year, uh, I'd be pretty surprised. But um, in, indications, you know, in SEC country after one week is that this conference is going to be pretty, pretty tight. Even in Alabama's win, there were some things, especially on defense, that didn't look all that great for them. So I would say that conference, I can speak on the SEC, that looks like a pretty tight conference of course, through 60 minutes. Right. And obviously, as this uh, moves forward, more teams. And like I said, there's no off weeks. I mean, even the lower SEC teams can give uh, the, the bigger ones, you know, a run for their money at certain times. So it, it really going to show all the teams what they're made of with these schedules condensed. And every game does matter a little more. So we're technically three weeks into the college season. But again, it depends on your conference, if it's one or two. And Big Ten gets to join the fun here in about three weeks now, if my math is right. Uh, so that'll be great to see. So next time we will have some uh, some more college football to talk about. Whereas now, it feels like it's been on for a month, and it has, depending on the school, but you're really just getting out of the blocks with it. So there's not as many storylines. There's no Heisman conversations because all the guys that would be, um, you know, talked about it only played 60 men's football, like you said. Right. So uh, – to, to f jump here to what I know Nick's been dying to talk about, um, there's some basketball game that was on last night uh, that, that's moving forward. Before we get to the teams and, uh, you know, everything else, I think we do need to talk about how well the bubble worked out and how it got everybody where we needed to go. It got us to a championship, and we're almost to a point. They're not going to ruin it now, but some fans might have been able to make this happen. Like, there's talks with baseball being in the playoffs now that – they want to have the World Series in, I think, San Diego, actually. You've probably heard about this yeah. in the pod, you know, in the new stadium with a limited amount of fans and just make it a bubble atmosphere for the players. It's Padres maybe, home game. Let's yeah. do it. Let's so do it. It's maybe, it's maybe something that could have happened with the NBA Finals, but they're like, no, we're going to push ahead in this bubble format. Uh, game one goes to L.A. Um, with a surprising opponent of Miami Heat that we didn't necessarily expect to get there but we also didn't expect Denver to get to the Western Conference Finals so a couple of little I think these younger teams adapted to the bubble a little more I think they they're used to AAU tournaments and they're used to just being with their guys for long periods of time some of these more veteran teams with wives and kids and families 
maybe we're ready to get the hell out of there, you know? So I, I'm not saying that as an excuse, but I think it's something worth mentioning. But these are the teams that we got. Uh, game one went down yesterday. Big win for the Lakers. As a Laker fan, how are you feeling uh, after game one and then trying to keep your feet on the ground for the rest of the series? Oh, yeah. My feet are in the air, jumping around, celebrating. Oh, yeah. Um, very excited. Very excited. Um I think I think the thing that we could we could look at um, before, of course, we get into the finals. We talked about we speculated through a couple of games when we did this podcast last. Who's going to benefit and who is going to suffer? Um, I I theorized that Houston would benefit because they're really fast and they had a lot of time off, and I and I figured you know older teams would probably benefit. But um, as this, these finals have, have come around, I, I, I think that Miami, the youth, uh, and the excellent shooting, I think what I've noticed, and Phil, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, is that the teams that shoot really well actually might have played well. Um, I don't think Milwaukee is a terrific three-point shooting team. Miami has proven they have a couple of uh, Steph Curry wannabes right there, Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero. Um, those I need a hero things got old really fast. Um, but yeah, the great shooting teams, in my opinion, flourished and then the others didn't. But even though I say that there was one team in LA that just didn't perform like they should have, in my opinion, the only explanation of that isn't shooting or isn't anything. It's that they went to the bubble thinking they won the championship before they won the championship. I think that was the problem with them. Yeah, no, we uh, we mentioned that. I'm trying to remember what it was tied to. I think it was the with the Bruce Arian thing about, you know, is this a championship or bust year? I agree. I think the Clippers went into it a little too nonchalant, and Denver was not a team that you expected to win a championship, but they are, much like Utah mm -hmm. does this in, in the past couple of years, and these teams just, it, it could be a bad matchup, and it just, it worked out for them that they were able to take mm -hmm. them out. And I think if they... Could, and it obviously uh, resulted in the firing of Doc Rivers, who had been there for a long time. But it's crazy yeah. to think that as long as he's been there, he never won a playoff series, which is absolutely <laughs> insane. Because you think of the, the Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, Lob City teams uh, that we all, you know, remember fondly. So it's interesting to see where he's going to go. I've heard whispers of Philadelphia. I know there's a couple other places that he could end up. But, yeah, mm -hmm. only one Lake, only one L.A. team, like you said, um, did what was needed to get to this point and they're yep. the ones that are there and they deserve it mm -hmm. so the the first game obviously big win for the lakers i, I do you think obviously you're picking the lakers to win do the heat <laughs> win one game do you think they steal two do you think they get swept uh what do you how many games are you willing to give them here uh one, one. um one that, that's that's my bias talking um mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not. It's it's unfortunate. I feel bad for the Heat. You know, Goran Dragic is 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 uh, down and out. Um, that is a huge loss. Bam out of bio is shaking up. He's not the same. But my goodness, I heard throughout the playoffs, I heard um, you know that the Lakers, LeBron's too old. I heard you know that the West is loaded. Uh, they're not ready to rock and roll. But what I saw was a team that took the four months off seriously, and I think. They had a good chance to win the finals, but they wouldn't. It, it, I mean, I can speak pretty. Uh, I can. I can be very calm about this. They would have won as easy as they won to the finals if it wasn't for the bubble. I think it would have been a lot harder. Yes. Now LeBron talks about it being harder. In my opinion, that's personal. That's that's you don't have your wife for three months and your kids. But people say, you know. How can you like? It's not harder. It's easier. It's like you don't know what these guys are feeling. You know, some I don't know who the player was who brought in that girl and yeah. got a for Houston. Who was yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, I, I forget. Yeah, David House. David mm -hmm. David House. Um, yep. You know, I'm sure other guys have been close to doing that. Lou Williams. We know what's going on with him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't love those wings. Come on now. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm sure they're great. Sure. But the point is, the Lakers, and to no surprise, a team under Eric Spoelstra. They they handled this uh, pandemic the best, and I think that's what separated them. I think the Heat had a decent chance of making the finals, and I think the Lakers had a good chance. But it became an, almost impossible for them to be beat based off how they prepared versus other guys prepared. And I think that was the difference. I think the Lakers, if they made the finals, they would have gone like six or seven in one or two of these rounds. 
Yeah. But um, yeah, they just look way more prepared uh, throughout the course of these finals. The Heat, are getting a, the Heat are getting a lot of these comparisons to the 04 Pistons, a team that just had a lot of good players, but not a star, you know, over the top player. Um, so they're getting a lot of those comparisons. And obviously that's a team that did beat, you know, the Lakers in, in a finals. So that's why they're getting the comparison. So a lot of things we need to change for Miami for this to go right. Uh, you, you mentioned Tyler Hero. Nick, I know you're younger than me, but uh, this will make us all feel old. Tyler Hero is the first player born in the 2000s to play in an NBA yeah. Finals. Is that insane or what? Yeah, you know, you and me are Madden guys. You know, I used to go create my own player, and I couldn't choose my birthday because I'm too young. Yeah. But, uh, we, you know, we're, we're the age of quite a few of these guys. are young or older, you know. Yeah, now um, now when we put our birth year in, we got to scroll down a, a little bit to even find it now. So, you know, that, that that's a good shot to the Brutal. ego. I mean, and, and you see these guys, I mean, like Asante Samuels, one of my favorite players of all time. I'm now watching his son play at Florida State. Frank Gore's son is now in college. These guys that we grew up watching as, like, in their prime, now not only do they have kids, but they have kids that are two to three years away from being in the NFL. If Frank Gore – keeps it up, he's going to be in the league with his son at some point. Like, if he's yeah, going to yeah. hang on another three years, which is nothing for him, I guess. Uh, he's 30, great. Yeah, 37 years so old. Uh, he's, the, I believe, the oldest running back to start an NFL game, so at 37. So, good on him. In that list of all-time r- rushing leaders, you know, Walter Payton, Barry Sanders, Jim Brown, Frank Gore is, is – is, if he keeps us going, he will be the all-time leading rusher, mm-hmm. you know. Walter Payton and Emmett Smith will be looking up at Frank Gore, which is amazing to me. And and soon enough, we'll be seeing, you know, the guy we loved and, and idolized, maybe the greatest corner of all time, Deion Sanders. Maybe his kid plays at Jackson State, and uh, maybe he does something and goes to the league too. So that would be kind of crazy to see all these guys and their kids that we used to watch. Yeah, yeah Jackson State is one of those teams that elected to play uh, in the spring. So uh, there'll be no other football on, and I'll, I'll be checking out Deion's team. For sure, I'm sure they're oh, going to get. Are playing them. in the spring? They are spring. Yep, because mm-hmm. that's FCS. That's uh, HBCU. All that situation. So they. Uh, yeah. yeah so, super. Yeah, so we'll have some extra stuff to watch here towards uh, the end of uh, as as the year turns over to 2021. Even when football's over, it's not really over. So that'll be that'll be great to see. Uh, it'll 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 have us prepared for 2022 in the spring. Yes. You know, with the news coming out today, mm-hmm. it'll keep us prepared for that. Yeah, breaking news that the XFL is going to come back. They're going to give themselves the extra year to gather. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the owner, has announced 2022. We expect the XFL back, and we'll be covering that as things go on. Uh, One last note here. Uh, The first championship in the COVID era has been crowned with the Tampa Bay Lightning hoisting the Stanley Cup. Congrats to those guys out there. I mean, that, that had to have been tough. And while most of these bubbles are in Florida, this one was actually up in Canada. So this was definitely a road trip uh, for those guys, especially after the embarrassment of last year, being the number one seed and getting swept in the first round. So to come all the way back from that and uh, win the cup. I mean, I, I'm a very casual hockey fan. I consider myself a Flyers fan by default, being Philadelphia sports. I also like the Islanders because my parents are from Long Island. And it's the one New York team that the team is actually on Long Island. And then so easily third has got to be uh, the Lightning just because they're, they're here and they do they do seem to be one of the best ran franchises in the state of Florida, I think. Uh, the Heat is the other one. Obviously, they've been – there's never really been yeah. a bad Heat team in my lifetime that I remember. Uh, so, shout out to them for sure for hoisting Lord Stanley and, that, and uh, getting rid of the issues from last year. So, as we wrap up here, I want to thank Nick for coming to hang out with us. I want to thank you guys for listening. And if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't already – please hit subscribe. I'm on that run for 100 subscribers. I only need about three or four more. So if you're not already, go ahead and hit that and hit the little bell so you don't miss an episode. Uh, Nick, thanks for hanging out. Good luck with the rest of the series. Uh, I'm sure I'll be able to hear you yelling from my house during game two. So I want to thank you guys for watching and listening to the Phil Talk Sports Podcast, and we'll see you next time.